I grew up with a Jesuit missionary priest, Father Rick Thomas, in a Catholic missionary community uh, in New Mexico, right on the border of Mexico. He was from Tampa, Florida, and he was about as drawly southern <laughs> white as you could get, right? until he was sent to be a missionary in Mexico. My mom from Arizona was one of his first volunteers. And two years later, my dad from Rhode Island moved down and became one of his first volunteers as well. And they met and married uh, while milking cows on the Lord's Ranch, which is probably where my, my skill set came from. <laughs> Both of them continue to work as full-time missionaries, and they run what's now the Lord's Ranch. Um, they run it full-time as well as my brother and his wife and kids who have moved back there recently. A, a recent book has been published on it, A Poor Priest for the Poor. Someone wrote a really good preface for it you might want to check out. <laughs> so how far will a missionary go for the sake of the gospel? That's the, uh, the question that I'm going to be focusing on today. And I bring up my parents and Father Thomas because, for me, they continue to be examples of how far Will someone go for the sake of the gospel? My dad's dad was an incredibly successful uh, harbor drudging and asphalt um, and, and bridge building construction worker who owned his own businesses in New York, Rhode Island, and, um, and Boston. And yet my dad was willing to, to become Mexican, to become a, essentially a transplant to the border of Mexico for the sake of the poor, as was Father Thomas, as was my mom, Marianne. She was just here last weekend visiting, and she was recalling some of the stories when we lived as a family in Mexico, when she was walking out to pump water, to carry the water back to the house, collecting wood all day to build a, to build a fire, to heat the water so that we could cook and shower and everything. I mean, a hard life as a missionary and how much she loved it, and how much she loves being a missionary, and how much it takes to actually invest oneself in bringing the gospel. And this is only the pre-evangelization part of evangelization. This isn't even the primary work of the missionary. Pre-evangelization is everything that must be done in order to prepare the soil for sowing the gospel message. I have become all things to all men, says St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, in order just to save some. In order just to save some. He gave up everything, all of his old identity, in order just to save some. Missionaries ask of us, demand of us, the question of how much we are willing to go, how far we are willing to go for the sake of the gospel. I just caught a glimpse of what pre-evangelization is like in a completely new culture. Just a few years ago, in the summer of 2014, I, I was sent for the summer to spend two months here in, in Kyrgyzstan, which is incidentally the closest I've ever come to China. You can see it's right on the border of China. And you can see that, that, uh, that lake up north there, Lake Isikul. Uh, I lived in an illicitly purchased United Nations refugee tent. <laughs> for two months right along that lake, uh, working on my Russian, thinking I was going to be a, a missionary to Russia for the rest of my life. Didn't work out. Here I am. And, uh, and teaching English to Muslim college students. And this was all in the service of what we call pre-evangelization, uh, just trying to get to know a culture, just trying to sort of immerse ourselves in a new culture for the first time. And it's not, um, it's not easy. The first day, the first meal served to me was the national meal, which is called um, bish parmak, which is uh, ground horse meat. And it was served with the, most, with the delicacy, the Chinese uh, drink delicacy, which is called kumus, which is a, uh, a um, fermented horse milk. It's, uh, it's, it's left to ferment in the sun for several weeks before they drink it. It's um, indescribable. <laughs> <laughs> Just put it that way. And they love it. And drinking it was, you know, um, part of my own pre-evangelization, enculturation. St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Society of Jesus, gave famous directives to two Jesuits on their way to Ireland. He gave them a letter 
about how to go about this pre-evangelization or accommodation, or as we've come to know it today, enculturation. And this is what he says. Quote, in dealing with men of position or influence, if you are to win their affection for the greater glory of God, our Lord, look first to their disposition and accommodate yourself to them. I became all things to all men. He quotes 1 Corinthians 9.22. Whenever we wish to win someone over and engage him in the greater service of God our Lord, we should use the same strategy for good that the enemy employs to draw a good soul to evil. The enemy enters through the other's door and comes out his own. He enters with the other, not by opposing his ways, but by praising them. And then little by little, he tries to come out his own door always portraying some error or illusion under the appearance of good by which will always be evil. And then Ignatius continues. So we may lead others to good by praising or agreeing with them on a certain point, leaving aside whatever else may be wrong. And thus, after gaining his confidence, we shall meet with better success. In this sense, we enter his door with him but we come out our own. We need to be able to beat the devil at his own game, is what Ignatius is teaching us, uh, even if it means a certain amount of accommodation, which some people are uncomfortable with. Accommodation and pre-evangelization are synonymous words for what we now call enculturation, this blending of incarnation and culture, which is what Jesus did for us. He was the first, as we find in Hebrews 2.17, to become like us in all things. We find few better examples of this principle of enculturation than in Matteo Ricci, an Italian-born man who became Chinese for the sake of the gospel. Now, Ricci and I have very little in common. His doorway to China was through mathematics and astronomy. My doorway to El Salvador, Kyrgyzstan, and Notre Dame was soccer, ping pong, playing Enrique Iglesias songs on the guitar, and boxing. <laughs> However, I can't say I'm proud of all my methods. However, while learning about him for this talk and thinking about the creativity of missionaries and the willingness that missionaries have to, to transform themselves for the sake of the gospel, my zeal was renewed for this principle of divine accommodation that we're invited to participate in. Incarnating Catholicism in culture, being willing to do whatever it takes to bring the gospel to our culture. I think Ricci would have a little less concern about how we do this than that we do it, and that we're always striving to find ways to do it. So, servant of God, whoops. Sometimes you're out of order. Servant of God, Matteo Ricci, was born in 1552. In the beautiful design of divine providence, he was born the same year, ah, never mind, not out of order, the same year that St. Francis Xavier died here within eyesight of the coast of China, where he wanted to go his whole life as a missionary. And he died on a small island off the coast of China the same year that Matteo Ricci was born. Ricci was born in the Italian town of Maserata, a town perhaps best known at the time for being on the pilgrimage route to Mary's house in Loreto, Italy, which you can see just north of it, which Ricci knew very well as a child. This was the house of Mary that has supposedly been picked up from Nazareth and flown by angels to Italy. Uh, where it was then uh, dressed up by a be beautiful Italian uh, basilica. Maybe this was all prophetic of Ricci's own transplant and makeover from Italian to Chinese. At the age of 18 in 1571, Ricci went to the Jesuit novitiate in Rome and asked there to be accepted as a Jesuit novice. Taking vows after two years, he was sent to the Roman college to study philosophy, and humanities. And it was there that he had teachers to whom he would owe a tremendous amount throughout his career for their brilliant instruction. Great men, including St. Robert Bellarmine and the great um, mathematician, 
an astronomer, Christopher Clavius. Ricci would especially owe a tremendous amount to Clavius, one of the great Jesuit astronomers and mathematicians of all time, a definite Hall of Famer. He is one of 35 Jesuits who have a moon crater named after them currently. You didn't know that. <laughs> We're everywhere. <laughs> Galileo and Kepler were two great admirers of Clavius, and it was partly his support for heliocentrism that made it acceptable eventually to the learned. Clavius created the Gregorian calendar that we still use, and, uh, which was approved by Pope Gregory XIII, and Ricci would bring this calendar to China. An enormous part of Ricci's success in China would come from his knowledge of astronomy and geometry, which he learned from the man called the Euclid of the 16th century. Ricci departed for China at the age of 24 in 1576, never to see his home or his family again, though he would never stop missing home and writing letters home. He strove to accept the principle in the words of one of his Jesuit brothers, that the Jesuit is, quote, in every place at home as in the Roman college in every place with his fathers and his brothers, in every place so well that he feels no change, unquote. He traveled with a group of Jesuits from Portugal around the southern point of Africa until he first uh, came to India, Goa, India, which you see right there in the center, where the remains of St. Francis Xavier are today. Ricci, when he arrived, Oh, and he was ordained in 1580, right below that in Cochin. If you see Cochin, just down below Goa, just south of that. When Ricci arrived, he was shocked by the treatment of Indians in India, not only by the Portuguese, but by his own fellow Jesuits. He was among a minority of Jesuits who supported the entrance of Indians into the Society of Jesus. And we find him very passionate about racial discrimination. Quote, this people, the Indian people, is much prostrated in our land, and nobody else would help them except for us, the Jesuits. For this reason, we have shown them much love. But his method of enculturation hadn't sunk in yet, which we can tell, I think, from the way in a letter he noted his satisfaction that the Thomas Christians, these Christians who had been in India, they claimed since the time of St. Thomas, who evangelized India, and who had their own cultures and rites and Eucharistic prayer and, and all of these things, uh, he noted with satisfaction that now they were dressing after the fashion of Portuguese clergy and that they say mass wearing vestments made in the same way as ours and they present the wafer at mass not as loaves as they are wont to do. This letter I think is a great contrast to the Ricci we're gonna discover soon in China. Finally, in 1582, Ricci was sent to Macau, China. This was a dream come true for him and for all Jesuits. Before Ricci arrived, there were only five Jesuits in Macau, all of whom were only working with the Portuguese and none of whom had bothered to learn Chinese. Macau was not really considered by most Chinese to be China proper either. So Ricci, was, Ricci was, would not be satisfied with staying in Macau. It was a city of trade filled with people of all nationalities. And the first Jesuits there were basically working with the traders. Traders, not traders. It was Michel Ruggieri, Ricci's Jesuit superior, who was the first Jesuit to begin learning Chinese and to emphasize the absolute need to learn the language. It was also Ruggieri, Michel Mugier, Ruggieri in 1582, who first exchanged his Jesuit cassock for Buddhist robes in order to, quote, carry the light of Christ to the Chinese. It was the only way that they as foreigners would be allowed to travel to and stay in the more interior city of Jiaoxiang, which you see just to the northwest of Macau there where the Chinese were very suspicious of foreigners and especially of the Portuguese. The Jesuits needed the patronage of Wang Pan, who was a devout Buddhist Mandarin, and so they began inculturating themselves in order to enter into his door. 
Arriving in Jiaoxiang was what Ricci called an enchanted dream. He was finally, for the first time, in China proper. And he was finally starting off where Xavier had left off. While there, Ricci began studying Mandarin. And this was a conscious decision to learn the language of the elite and the language of the educated rather than the language of the common people. One of Ricci's first observation about the Jesuits in China, which I love, was that they were holy but not very useful. He wrote to a friend, <laughs> you may know some Jesuits that way. He wrote to a friend, quote, to know our own language without knowing theirs serves us nothing. And he was very disappointed that the Jesuits had done so little to accommodate themselves to Chinese culture. Ricci always had his goals set high, and the reason he wanted to uh, learn the language of the elite and the educated was that from the very beginning he had as his goal going to Beijing and getting from the emperor permission for the Jesuits to preach in China. Because they kept get th getting thrown out over and over again. And he knew that the only way that couldn't happen anymore is if he got imperial support. And everyone told him it was crazy. A foreigner cannot go into the imperial city, cannot appear before the emperor. You will never get that support. But that's, that's the goal he had in mind. And so it was while he was in Jiaoxiang that Ricci slowly began the process of enculturation. He began to wear Buddhist robes. They lived in a residence built for them by Wang Pan, not in this uh, Buddhist pagoda. This is present day Jiaoxiang. That was the pagoda that Wang Pang built, and he built for them right next to it a house for the Jesuits to live in. And he called it the Sacred Flower Temple, a term from Buddhist texts, which they accepted, and they regularly identified themselves as monks for India, from India, which could only be understood by the Chinese at the time as Buddhist monks, right? because Buddhism had come from India to China. In Jiaoxiang, Ricci began in earnest his transformation into a Chinese man. He changed his name, um, taking a Chinese name, Li uh, Mado, uh, which, Mado, thank you, Li Mado, uh, which he would continue to use. It was basically just a transliteration. It doesn't really mean anything, though, Do, Do, Do. Ah, it's so hard, tonal. Do means teacher or scholar, and there, there could be a reason that he included that third character. You see the name is made up of three characters. But it's really just a transliteration of Matteo. Uh, and it was Ricci who was the first to transliterate Chinese into uh, Western languages, a system that is still used today. He drew his first world map with China, you notice, in the center, enculturating it again this seems small, but I mean, every Western map had Europe in the center. <laughs> so why not put China in the center uh, for China? And this would become an extremely popular map. The Chinese had never before seen a map of the world. They had no idea what was outside, and they, they were blown away by this map. And it was, it was incredibly popular. He got himself a Confucian teacher to begin teaching him the Confucian classics. And it was during this time that he wrote home, quote, I have become a Chinese. It seems that I will finish my earthly existence in the few days that God will grant me in accommodating myself and loving this land as much as I can. His goal was to bring God to China. Becoming Chinese was the means to that goal. Ricci yearned for conversions. He wrote to a friend that, quote, those who are here dream of nothing else day and night but he always proceeded with caution. And as he also wrote, we do not want to force them to become Christians. We're satisfied with laying the groundwork when his divine majesty opens the way. Our time in China is not yet one of harvest. Ricci was patient while everything he did was for the gospel. Quote, we've left everything, our country, our dear friends, and we are dressed in the clothes and the shoes of China. We speak, we eat, we drink, and we dress in nothing but the manners of China. In 1589, Ricci left Xiaoxiang and went north 
to Nanchang, uh, where he would stay for three years before continuing on from there to Nanjing. And this is really where the second stage of Ricci's Chinese mission began in 1593. Uh, he decided that he needed a new vision for enculturating into China. Um, he decided that dressing and looking like a, monk, a, a Buddhist monk no longer worked because the, the fasting that the priests and the monks do, the celibacy of Buddhist monks and of Catholic priests, it was just too confusing. And everyone was just confusing them with Buddhist monks. And he decided that it wasn't working. So instead, he decided to become a more kind of um, non-classifiable uh, Dao Ren, or a, 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 an educated man, like the mandarins who ran the country. He, from now on, would focus on incorporating Confucian teaching into his evangelization instead of looking like a Buddhist. And he would, from now on, completely repudiate Buddhism. He would become a Confucian master. And he hired for himself a Confucian master and began to dress like a Confucian scholar. And this is the Ricci that we know. On the left is the, 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 uh, a portrait of Ricci that we have closest to the time. So that's, that's the best guess we have of how he actually looked, painted by a Chinese uh, convert. By 1595, the transformation was complete. From shaved head and shaved face to long beer and beard and Mandarin hat. Ricci described himself as one dressed, quote, completely in the style of the literati, the educated which is quite honorable, and wearing a square beret in the shape of a cross, quite similar to our own priestly berets. From here on out, he would strongly attack Buddhism and Taoism while praising Confucianism, which he considered a natural religion with no knowledge of the supernatural, and so not demonic. And he would now spend the rest of his life working on a Christian Confucian synthesis. This decision was a significant turning point for Ricci, and between 1598 and 1610 at his death, it would prove to be hugely successful. While in Nanchang, Nanjing, and eventually Beijing, Ricci's reputation grew so much that his day was made up entirely of visits from the educated and the powerful. Dinner parties where he entered their door by teaching them Western mathematics and astronomy, primarily. He was called by the Chinese a second Ptolemy. He successfully predicted solar eclipses, which they were not able to do. And he taught them how to do it. He and his friend, Shu uh, Guangxi, or something like that, Dr. Paul, <laughs> as he was known um, in the West, servant of God, by the way, Dr. Paul. Uh, a tremendous man and one of Ricci's uh, closest friends, together translated Euclid's elements of, of geometry and Clavius into Chinese. And that translation continues to be used to this day. Ricci built astrolabs and sundials and drew maps. He built and he serviced clocks, which were incredibly popular in China. The emperor wanted one. And actually what got Ricci allowed to stay in the imperial city when he got there was the emperor didn't want his clock technician <laughs> to be kicked out of the city in case his clock stopped working. He introduced the Gregorian calendar, and everyone admired Ricci, though they couldn't figure out what he was doing there. <laughs> they just admired him. <laughs> they thought he was amazing. So much so that one of his most powerful friends, a really eminent scholar named uh, Li Zhe, would describe him in this way, quote, he can speak our language fluently, write our script, and act according to our rules of conduct. He is an extremely impressive man, a person of inner refinement, outwardly most straightforward. In an assembly of many people, all talking in confusion, with each one holding to his own point of view, <laughs> he was an Irish, uh, Ricci keeps his silence and cannot be provoked to interfere or become involved. Amongst the people of my acquaintance, no one is comparable to Ricci. Quite a, uh, a telling statement from this great scholar. Ricci also impressed with his tremendous memory. He had mastered the ancient technique of the memory palace, which was this, this way of remembering things by creating a palace in your mind and attaching concepts to different 
uh, items in the palace. You can ask uh, my, the Father Michael McGree, who I live with, more about it. He used the memory palace of Ricci to study for his comprehensive exams last year. To great success, it worked. <laughs> he passed. And he was in very high demand by young students because the only way to move up in Chinese society at the time was to pass this incredibly difficult national exam. And everyone spent all their time from the youngest age um, having mental breakdowns trying to pass this exam. It was, it was grueling. And so Ricci was, was in high demand as someone who could teach the method of the memory palace. He had a tremendous memory, and he thought the memory palace was really made for Chinese characters. He, uh, he could memorize and recite long passages of Confucius in Chinese, and then just to impress, recite it back in reverse. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and people were blown away, of course, by this process. He would be shown long lists of random Chinese characters, and with one glance, have them turn it away and just describe them in order. And he had a tremendous memory, and he, he attributed this to the memory palace. He, uh, he wrote, his first book that he wrote was a little text on friendship, a hundred sayings on friendship from Greek and Roman authors, uh, ancient authors. And it was very, very popular in China. But of course, he had no books with him. He wrote this book with 100 excerpts entirely from memory. And he would write all his books that way, just from memory. Ricci hobnobbed in Nanchang with the most powerful and intelligent mandarins in the country. He received there the supreme compliment that, quote, there's nothing foreign about him except for his face. He'd become Chinese. But he also had some opportunities to preach the gospel. One of the most dramatic ones, which reveals Ricci's carefully controlled passion that sometimes uh, broke out, I think, was during a famous debate organized by one of his friends in Nanjing. Ricci was in uh, invited to attend a banquet. And he was seated next to an eminent Buddhist scholar, Hong Un, a brilliant speaker at the height of his career, who had spent his entire life studying Buddhism. They were seated next to each other before the banquet so they could talk. I'll cut short the debate just so that you can kind of see Ricci in action with just some of the juicy parts. Hong Un decided, demanded to speak about religion with Ricci, who was waiting quietly. Ricci was, responded, quote, before we discuss anything, I'd like you to tell me what you think of the first principle, the creator and lord of heaven and earth and of all created things, whom we call Tianzhu, the lord of heaven. And I'm sorry, apparently there's a good chance that I'm saying heavenly pig, but <laughs> I mean to be saying lord of heaven, okay, for any of you who know Chinese. Hong Un responds, there is indeed such a creator, but he's not great, for all human beings are equal to him probably here referring to the Buddhist teaching that all humans have the potential to become Buddhists. Ricci responds, can you do the same things as the creator of heaven and earth? Hong, Hong Un responds, yes, I can create heaven and earth. Again, probably thinking of the Buddhist teaching that all phenomena is the creation of human consciousness. To which Ricci responded, well, I don't want to burden you with creating heaven and earth. Can you just recreate this fire pot here for me, please? <laughs> Hong An shouting, it's ridiculous for you to ask this, and Ricci shouting even louder, you should not have promised something you can't do. <laughs> <laughs> and they proceeded shouting at each other until his host came over and separated them, told them to go back to their respective corners <laughs> and <laughs> get a breather. Needless to say, they both thought they won. And also... Uh, needless to say, the dinner had to continue and they were separated to opposite ends of the table. Ricci was seated at the place of honor because he was the honored guest. And while the scho scholars around him debated for an hour on fine points of Buddhist Confu and Confucian doctrine, he remained silent, such that they assumed he couldn't keep up with the fine points of their conversation. So finally, one of them, out of courtesy, after over an hour of discussing, said, um, and, and what do you think about this? To which he first proceeded by giving himself a long, detailed summary of the entire argument so far, and then his own response, 
his own equally long response, which completely shocked them and uh, silenced them. And then they all stood up and applauded him. But while this was a great moment, the apex of Ricci's career, the practical, pragmatic missionary that he was, was being invited into the throne room of the emperor, uh, Emperor Wan Li. Wan Li was not present. He was a kind of absentee emperor. Um, but this was still an extraordinary achievement for a Westerner to be invited into the imperial throne room in Beijing and to be able to uh, approach the, um, the throne and um, make an act of, of reverence. Along with this mark of distinction, Emperor Wanli asked for one of Ricci's maps for himself. And Ricci made a new copy of this map and it hung in the imperial palace. This was as good as an official edict, allowing the Jesuits to remain in China and do their work. When Ricci finally died in 1610 from complete exhaustion and overwork in the service of the gospel, he was the first foreigner ever to be given an imperial burial. Now, not everyone agreed with the enculturation methods of Father Ricci. Even within his own order, again, we've seen that Ricci took his he took his method from St. Paul, I've become all things to all. But Ricci was succeeded as superior of the Chinese mission by another Italian, Niccolo Longobardo. And Niccolo had a lot of problems with Ricci's method. First, he had issues with ancestor worship. So Alessandro Valignano, the head of the Jesuit missions in the East, had instructed Je Jesuit missionaries in Japan that they could participate in the rites of ancestor veneration. And so Ricci, when he arrived in China, participated in the spring and autumn sacrificial rites to Confucius, not as worship, but as veneration, because again, he didn't consider Confucianism to be a, a supernatural religion. He considered it to be a natural sort of secular religion, one that came from the, the, the people themselves, out of their culture. And he defended himself by saying that what they practice is not superstitious because the reason they give for it is to serve the dead as if they were still living and to remember them by offering them you know, food and drink, knowing that they don't, they themselves knowing that the ancestors don't come to eat and drink. Nevertheless, Niccolo did not agree. The second battle was over the Chinese name to be given to God. The first missionaries to China had just transliterated Deus into Chinese sounds, which made no sense to them. And Ricci wanted to give God a Chinese name that they could understand, uh, kind of like how the word Deus itself comes from Zeus, or uh, God comes from the German Gott, all of which had previous content. Actually, neither Ruggieri nor Ricci first came up with a name. It was Chen Ri, one of the first converts, a young man who began referring to God by the ancient Confucian word Tianzhu, Lord of Heaven. Ricci added to this name Shangdi, which was the ancient Confucian word for the sovereign from on high, and he actually preferred this term. Niccolo thought that Ricci had compromised Catholic doctrine for the sake of enculturation. Ricci was not willing to accommodate everything. He would not accommodate with Buddhism, only with Confucianism, again, because he didn't consider it demonic. He didn't consider it to be a supernatural religion. He thought it was a, just kind of a natural cultural religion. He was careful to correct the identification of Guan Jin, a bodhisattva of fertility, and uh, who was often depicted holding a child, a Buddhist image, uh, with Our Lady something that even missionaries themselves confused. He was careful always to, to, um, to fix this confusion. But what about Ricci's reluctance to preach the crucifixion? In his telling of the story of Jesus in his book, The True Meaning of the Lord of Heaven, Ricci completely omits the crucifixion. Is this acceptable? After all, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, 2 writes, I decided not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ crucified. In private, of course, Ricci taught catechumens about the cross, and he and Ruggieri would teach them about the cross using the Chinese symbol for the number 10. And he would distribute bronze crosses for believers to wear, but not in public. 
Was this cowardly? Well, one of his reasons, I think, is demonstrated from an experience that Ricci had while he was in Beijing. Ma Tong, one of the most powerful imperial eunuchs, ransacked Ricci's house, and while he was doing so, found a crucifix covered in, painted in blood. And, and the Chinese had never before seen these kind of, um, what they called living portraits of people. They never, they had much more kind of a flat um, way of painting, and they'd never seen what the emperor called when he saw a picture of Mary, uh, of Jesus, a, a living Buddha, he said. They, they, they seemed so alive to them. So when they saw a crucifix that was so realistically portrayed, covered in, in red blood, they thought that Ricci had brought it uh, as an example of how they were going to kill the emperor. Right? And, so, and they were appalled by this Western method of killing that they found here. And so Ricci decided to tell them, don't imagine this is what you think it is. He says, it is in fact a great saint of our country who wanted to suffer the pains of the cross on our behalf. And for this reason, we've painted him in this way. Prudent or cowardly, eh, you can decide. Instead, they led with images of Mary. It was an image of Mary that converted Dr. Paul and maybe the Chinese, like the Aztecs with Our Lady of Guadalupe, maybe they needed a mother first. Either way, Ricci's success was undeniable. After his death, three Jesuit mathematicians succeeded him and became personal consultants to the emperor. One century later, there were 200,000 Christians in China. Eventually, after the Jesuits of China met together in conference, they disagreed with Niccolo and made all the Jesuits promise to follow the methods of Father Ricci. In 1659, the sacred congregation for the propagation of the faith would agree with the Jesuits, changing their position from 14 years previously with this instruction. Do not put forward any arguments to convince these people to change their rights, their customs, or their usages, except if they are evidently contrary to the religion and morality. What would be more absurd than to bring France, Spain, Italy, or any other European country to the Chinese. Do not bring to them our countries. Instead, bring to them the faith. A faith that does not reject or hurt the rights, nor the usages of any people, provided these are not distasteful, but instead keeps and protects them. I think a beautiful description of what Ricci was trying to do. Ricci was vindicated for his own day, but I think the question remains open for us today. How far should we go to enculturate the gospel? How far is too far? Or maybe today, personally, that's not even the question we should be asking, but rather, am I doing enough to enculturate the gospel? There's a very popular saying around this place, God, country, Notre Dame, maybe you've heard it before. For Ricci, it would have been God, Italy, the Roman college. Right? That's where he went to college. But the last two, he was willing to completely let go for the sake of the gospel. He never went back to the Roman college. He never went back to Italy. He ceased to be an Italian man to become a Chinese man. And I think our own question today for us is, would I do the same? Would I become a Mexican or a Chinese for the sake of the gospel? And what am I doing, even if I'm not supposed to? If I'm supposed to remain here in this country, what am I doing to enculturate the gospel into my life and into my world. Ricci challenges us to examine what we're willing to do in our own culture to enculturate, remembering what St. John Paul II taught that, quote, the incarnation of the word was a cultural incarnation. The incarnation only becomes real as it becomes part of our culture. Otherwise, it's always a foreign element and it never really takes hold. It never really gets planted. Not being diluted by it, of course, but transforming it from within. Ricci gave every last ounce of strength, exhausting himself in the work of enculturating the gospel to China. And he challenges us today to do the same. So let's conclude by asking for Our Lady's intercession. Um, the one, Our Lady of Guadalupe, I think, who always is the model of enculturation, becoming an Aztec woman for the Aztecs. And so the response is, pray for us. Our Lady of Guadalupe, Queen of Enculturation. Pray for us. Amen. Thank you very much.